Welcome to Kansas City Experience, I'm Brad Austin. KCX is a monthly program that features segments from KCPT, Flatland, and 90.9 The Bridge. This month, we're gonna look at our Curious KC series and how the Latinx and Hispanic communities are contributing to the gallery of murals throughout Kansas City. When I make my own murals, or when I try to do something that I want to do, I usually go back to thinking about my mom because she's an important role in my life. We take a look at how art and design are being incorporated into affordable housing, and filmmaker Morgan Cooper gives us his thoughts on Kansas City's filmmaking community. That's how culture and society shifts, is when people see these stories that are honest and sincere. It can maybe change somebody's thoughts of what they might think of somebody of color and, and um, you know, what the black creatives in the city have to offer and, you know, to show that we're out here. With our American Graduate Reporting Series on Workforce Development, we take a look at the construction jobs here in Kansas City, and we find out how area schools are dealing with the challenges of school safety. We have a layering system of security, so if somebody does come into the building, there's a way of shutting areas for refuge off. From our 90.9 The Bridge sessions, we have music from the Get Up Kids, who will be performing with Jason Sudeikis, Will Forte, and many others at Thunder Gong on November the 9th. temperatures mean the start of chili season. We kick things off with the history of Dixon's Chili, the oldest family-owned restaurant in Kansas City. This location has been here since 1968. We're um, seven blocks north of the stadium. Well, Vern Dixon was my great uncle, and he started Dixon's in 1919. And then my dad took over in the 60s, and then I took over in 85. He actually had a cart out on the street, and he sold the chili, and then he opened a location at 15th and Olive. I think their rent was like $60 a month, and that was there until the 70s. You can't even tell that it was there now. I've driven by it, you know, in the last few years, and it's just completely gone. The area got bad, and he just went forward and moved out of that location. He had this store opened at that time, and uh, a store in Overland Park was opened at that time, too. Every time we closed one of those stores, those fans stayed with us, and now they all come here. My name is Steven Steffes. I am the general manager here, uh, fourth generation of the family. So our chili is not a tomato-based chili. It's served on a plate instead of a bowl. Uh, we cook our meat and beans separate. And the concept is we give you meat and beans and you kind of build your own chili. And then we ask you if you'd like to leave it dry or have it be soupy or juicy. Soupy is the bean broth and juicy is the meat juice. And then from there you use the chili powder, spicy vinegar, salt, and you get ketchup, cheese, onion. We try to do it the same way they did it 100 years ago. But we have like our own patented chili powder that's uh, my great great uncle's own recipe that he came up with. And then you can also get it over noodles or over a tamale, which is what Harry Truman ate. It's called our uh, tamale spread. It's the most popular chili item we sell. The reason why Harry liked our chili so much is it was the way they cooked chili back in the war. I know I'm biased, but I eat it, I eat it almost every day. My, everyone makes fun of me because I get the same thing. It's been 10 years, I eat spaghetti chili four times a day. No, I've never seen anyone make it the way we make it. Since we had so many Dixons everywhere, I feel like it's made us a destination restaurant. So we have tons of people from up north, tons of people from Kansas, tons of people from like Grandview and Blue Springs and Lee Summit. I'm grateful that it's been in the same family all these years. So why aren't there more Latinx murals in Kansas City? My name is Isaac Tapia. Um, I'm an artist muralist here in Kansas City, along with uh, Rodrigo, Rico. We both paint together. Uh, we kind of, rep we represent ITRA. It's our own um, I guess you could say company. We remember, in my opinion, we remember Cesar Chavez. We remember Frida. We remember Diego. 
we remember all of these artists that you know are there but we want to know in my opinion at least i want to know more than just that i want to know what's going on right now so i am originally from mexico city uh, my mom worked really hard to bring me here at the age of nine my sister she turned one here and um, basically been here ever since i went to paseo academy uh rico went all went there as well and we we did art when i make my own murals or when i try to do something that i want to do i usually go back to thinking about my mom because she's an important role in my life uh, she's always been an important role in my life so um Sometimes she doesn't know, sometimes she knows that I kind of try to paint as much as I can of her essence into the murals that I personally want to do. Like the mural that I'm working on in Overland Park here right now, it's a young woman from Oaxaca. That's where my mom is from, from this place called uh, San Pedro y San Pablo, Tequisepec, Oaxaca, Oaxaca, de Long Oaxaca, uh, where she lived at that is definitely a mouthful. <laughs> I feel like Rico and I are are trying to work hard, but we don't see as many. How many do you think we see? Jose Faust, Jose Faust. Alicia Gambino. So uh, we have some people to look up to. Emily Alvarez, your third cousin removed. <laughs> yeah, we, uh, we're painting uh, right now in Overland Park with alongside Aaron, Aaron Sutton and, and Emily Alvarez. And Emily herself is a Latin muralist who is also a girl. Which is Latin. which is not heard of ever. Yeah. In the scope of Latinx in general, it's just such a, you know, I think Americans forget that it's counting Central America as a continent, two whole continents full of people that Americans really just can have such a narrow view of sometimes, you know, just so many different cultural backgrounds, such, you know, colorful heritage that I think needs to be represented more as in the variety that it exists in, you know. It makes me sad to, uh, to know that there, there aren't that many people of our that shares the same culture and, and language and uh, world uh, that aren't doing murals, that aren't doing art, that aren't doing what we love to do and see. And uh, though we are fans of other muralists, we would like to see our kind also represented. So whenever we uh, produce murals, we do like to show and portray diversity. And I feel like the issue is to maybe get a little light on people that are doing this like we uh, mentioned Emily Alvarez we mentioned Aaron Sutton we, we mentioned other artists out there that are doing it that are of color that have you know kind of humble uh, beginnings but are doing big things out here and um, so we want to show that we can do it and I feel like in turn if there are kids that are you know forming their likes and dislikes in this world and, and find that art is something that they want to do for the rest of their lives why not do it and why not show that it is self-sustainable that you can be successful and yeah that's what we're trying to do hi my name's julia cole and i'm an artist and the question i have is um how could we build housing for the poor that is beautiful I think beauty is, it's connected to our capacity to find great solutions. The way that artists create beauty in the world is the way that all human beings do things with craft and attention to detail. If we aren't thinking about solutions that take care of the whole picture, we're not being very inventive. Design has a lot to contribute in order for us to think about housing in more flexible ways. It is very important for affordable housing to be beautiful. We shouldn't just pay attention to the functional aspects of affordable housing because beauty is something that supports our well-being, that supports our health, and that provides individuals 
a better sense of themselves and their role in society. A lot of our historic housing stock in the city, there are these incredible flares and strokes of creative designs. But where it's most interesting is we still have some older homes, historic homes that mix in with the new. And I think that's really what neighborhoods should be and, and what they can show us. Instead of just saying, let's have the biggest big government program and let's build 200 houses. Instead, what I'd like to see us do is, how do you get that mix? Through creating more opportunities for smaller scale developers and rehabbers to build housing stock in Kansas City. We're not actually often engaging some of our most creative folks. We can build things that are not only functional, but that have beautiful form as well, and that often the best solutions are ones that go deeper into uh, the meaning and the reason that we build things the way that they are. I think it's really important to create with purpose because in my space, it's a, it's a very white dominated space. You know, I, I come, I work in the commercial space. So when people see me, I think oftentimes there's a bit of a uh, surprise, you know, a young black cinematographer who's working at this level, you know, that's, I, I don't want that to be the case 20 years from now. When I look back on my career, you know, kind of the industry, how it is and how it's shaped is very much a reflection of society. People who are in this field are usually people who are more well off, who had opportunities growing up, um, you know, who were able to afford film school and, you know, you don't see a lot of, uh, especially below the line, you know, everybody who isn't, you know, a producer, writer, director, and so they're the day players on set. And that was also really important to me with this film is to showcase the below the line black technicians in our space. You know, sharing Lloyd's story as a black sound mixer was really important to me to celebrate the black technicians in our industry. With black films, black stories, oftentimes these characters are dreamt up people of what, you know, this writer thinks black people are like. And I just wanted to tell an honest story and show that, hey, we're normal black people. There are so many hardworking black people that just show up and just want to do a good job every day. That's it, you know. And so it was really important for me to tell and show the normalcy of my community. That's how culture changes. That's how culture and society shifts, is when people see these stories that are honest and sincere. It can maybe change somebody's thoughts of what they might think of somebody of color and, and um, you know, what the black creatives in the city have to offer and, you know, to show that we're out here. I want to inspire black creatives to, to take it a step further with their art, to not be afraid to tell our stories. You know, I think of my nephew, you know, I think of my cousins, I think of all these people who, you know, they look at me, they look up to me, and what do they see? You know, I want them to know that, hey, you don't have to just be what the society, you know, that we live in thinks you should be. You can wake up and be whoever you want to be. It's the worst nightmare of every teacher. Stay calm and stay quiet. Every student every parent. We're members of a club that no parent wants to join. They are walking out of school demanding stricter gun laws. Drop now! America has a problem with gun violence in schools. My oldest daughter said, you are the chief of police and you have four grandchildren in the Shawnee Mission School District. What are you going to do to protect them? How can we make our schools of the future safer for our children? And one of my biggest concerns is that we talk about school shootings like they're all the same, and they're not all the same. This is Gina Rose Montalto. She was 14 years old. She loved school. Best friend to her brother and a wonderful daughter to my wife and I. On February 14th of last year, she was gunned down in her school, in a place where we never thought it would happen. Gina was one of 17 students and staff who died in the mass shooting at the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in Parkland, Florida. No matter where you live, don't be lulled into a false sense of security thinking this can't happen in your neighborhood. According to the Washington Post, since the mass shooting at Columbine High School in 1999, 
More than 220,000 American students have experienced gun violence at school. At least 143 children, educators and other people have been killed and at least 289 have been injured. I would like to believe that we are safe little community that that doesn't happen in. Um, but I think everybody would like to believe that. School shootings remain rare, but they're still a concern for some local parents, like Phaedra Wheeler, who chose to enroll her sons in an online public school. The boys do most of their classes at home. You know, watching shooters walk into a school is very terrifying as a parent. I think that I wanted a little more safety. According to the Washington Post's data, in the last 20 years, there have been four school shootings in Missouri, with two fatalities and one injury, and none in Kansas. John Douglas heads up security at the Shawnee Mission School District on the Kansas side of the metro. Are we totally capable of preventing the, the next event in the future? We're working towards that, but I can't say we will ever be 100% positive we can do that. Like Douglas, Dan Carney, head of security for Kansas's Blue Valley Schools, studies school shootings. The vast majority of them are incidents in which either one person is killed or zero people are killed. There is no one common denominator, and as a result, systems for protection and strategies for defense have had to become extremely sophisticated Ball and flexible. Three. Still walking westbound, still armed with a gun. The design of the school building has an important part to play, but there's a balance to be struck. If the sole purpose was to be absolutely as safe as possible with no other consideration, we could build a school that looked more like a jail. And they would be safe, but they would not be conducive to education. One of the things that was really important in the design of this building, we want to reflect the culture of the community. This culture here was all about kids exploring the different ways of learning. In the design of its Summit Technology Academy, the Lee Summit School District in Missouri wanted architect Jim French not to come up with a jail. If you want to see a school to represent what school should be in the future, I highly encourage people to come see this wonderful building. There are open spaces, flexible classrooms, and lots of natural light, but there's also security. We have a layering system of security, so if somebody does come into the building, there's a way of shutting areas for refuge off. The Blue Valley and Shawnee Mission Districts have also invested heavily in technology, design, and personnel. But that can't be the only response. So part of what we do is encouraging respect for differences and encouraging an attitude of no person left behind. We want to have students who are comfortable coming to an adult to tell them, you know, hey, I saw this on social media last night and I'm really concerned. Project-based learning, as opposed to lecture-style teaching, can help develop these important relationships. There's programs here that students feel very, very close to their instructors. But there's only so much schools can do. The group Stand with Parkland also wants policy changes at all levels of government. We need to concentrate on improving mental health screening and support programs and responsible firearms ownership. Part of that is submitting to a, a background check for all sales or transfers of weapons. Part of that is storing your weapon safely. According to the Pew Research Center, nearly six in 10 US adults say gun laws should be stricter. One idea, floated by President Donald Trump, is to arm teachers with guns. Where a teacher would have a concealed gun on them, they'd go for special training. Here in Blue Valley School District, in this metro area, I don't think it makes any sense at all. It's one of those things that on its face seems to make sense, but practically it doesn't. I think that the risk is much greater of an accident. Teachers became teachers, and when I talk to most of them, the vast majority do not want to do this. For most schools, the actual chance of a shooting is tiny, and the risk of a mass shooting is even smaller. But, sadly, it's still something schools in the future will need to be ready for. Drop now! The 17 families that suffered this tragedy want to make sure that it doesn't happen again. We're members of a club that no parent wants to join. The age of the skilled trade workers today have become to the point where they're retiring about 10,000 to 12,000 
a day across the nation. And we need to make sure that we're backfilling that so that we can help continue to build Kansas City. This is Cerner Phase 3 and 4. Uh, my name's Tyler Petrie, a superintendent with Jay Dunn. I like to build things with my hands. I was always kind of hands-on. And I kind of like building tree houses, building different stuff out of scrap wood. I started out as a carpenter apprentice, actually wearing my tools and working with crews, working underneath foremen. And that was the most valuable uh, education I've ever had. There's a lot of construction opportunity right now. We're seeing a relatively big boom in construction. There's a lot of jobs on the books that we got and, and some ones that are upcoming that I personally don't see it slowing down for a while. We even have some of the, some kids that we've started out on this job that we're trying to keep going to the next ones and advance their careers. Uh, cement finishers, carpenters, uh, tinners, glazers, painters, Pretty much every trade in Kansas City out of the building trades we got out here. Without them, we, we can't build these buildings without young, talented people. Just the GED is required to start even at the building trades. The rate of pay is somewhere between $14 and $20 an hour, and you're earning incrementally more money each time you become a different advancement in your apprenticeship program. I would say don't get caught up in the people pressuring you to go into college saying that you need a degree to, to make something. This really is a, a great, it is a career. Um, there's a lot of people that I know personally from working at J.A. Dunn, just in different trades that have, have made a really good living without a four-year degree. And if there's always that option too, you know, if you want to go back to school, there's two-year associate's degrees that can help you get into more of a management field. And I believe, you know, if that's the path you want to go, you know, we, J. Dunn encourages that to the fullest. So they'll even try to help out and get you to pursue those those avenues. You know, if it's not for you, you're not cut out for it. You're you're, you're out very little money financially, and at least you always know that you you tried. But I encourage everyone to stick with it. You know, when you first start out, you gotta you're not gonna get the glorious job. You're gonna you're gonna start off at the bottom and work your way to the top. For me, I'm not gonna be content with settling. You know, I want to run the company one day, so I'm just always gonna shoot for the shoot for the stars. I think the sky's the limit is what J.O. makes you feel like. So as long as you work hard and have a good attitude and are a good leader, uh, they'll recognize that. There's all different things about the built environment around you that are challenges. And if you're good at problem solving, if you're good at looking forward, if you're good about thinking about things in the built environment, we want to have you challenge us about how we do things. And if you think there's another way to do it, come tell us about what that is so we can start the conversation.